Hi, uh, my talk is about the journey we took when we moved from monolithic architecture to uh, microservices architecture. So, how many of you here know this? This is the Krishna's butter ball in Pablo, and this is a single granite rock. This is the monolith, and this is probably a team when we were trying to support it. But you don't have to worry, it was supported by physics, friction, all those things. But our monolith wasn't like that. So, what we ended up was supporting multiple microliths, if you want to call it. So, uh, this, the journey and the lessons that we learned is the crux of the stuff. So, I uh, head the product engineering team at Match Street then. <coughs> we are an artificial intelligence and a computer vision startup. We build a suite of products for the retail industry. And we have different kinds of products, right from recommendation engines on e-commerce websites to marketing tools, video marketing, uh, social media marketing to products that can automate most of their warehouse and operations uh, stuff. So a lot of people think when we say Mastodon as a computer vision AI startup, we do a lot of deep learning stuff, uh, build models, neural networks, those kind of things. But the other half of the story is the engineering, right? So that is what I'm going to talk about. And I basically uh, prefer to call myself as a software engineer, but I also have interests in uh, general productivity, marketing, psychology, all those, all those things. And I blog about it in my blog, CNU.me. And you guys should probably follow me on Twitter at CNU. So coming back to the product that Matt Street builds, uh, this is called B.AI, and this is the uh, retail automation product and uh, we have uh, multiple different uh, this is sort of a platform on top of which we build multiple products and uh, to give you a very brief overview of how the data flows the customers are retail customers who give fashion or uh, uh, e-commerce websites and they give us the catalog and user events that are generated on the site to us and we do a lot of processing, image processing, data science, all those things. And finally, we give them recommendations and other kinds of tools, uh, products, and widgets. So this is what happens. And when we started two years back, uh, when I joined the Match Student as a solutions architect, I was given this monolithic architecture, which did this basically. There was an image processing piece. There was a script, a Python script, which did image processing took all the client's data, all the client's uh, image uh, data, did processing, stored it as individual files. Then there was an image searcher which indexed all these, uh, the data that we process and store is vector information, right? So it's a high dimensional vector, about 21,000 uh, elements in the vector. So this Im image searcher is able to index them and it is able to do a very fast search and return back the response to an API layer. So this is what we have. And uh, the, the first, the problem so this, this entire thing was contained in one, servers, uh, one server, and it was a very compute intensive server. We used like C4, 4x large, uh, because the image search was very, uh, it needed to handle millions of, uh, millions of requests per day. And uh, naturally, you need to put two missions behind, minimum two missions behind load balancer. And for some of our very big clients, we had multiple missions, and the cost for each client kept going in few thousands of dollars per month. And uh, the way we were using the servers were uh, there were practically no difference between using it as a bare metal server or a cloud server. We could replicate the same thing, put it in a bare metal server, and it would work fine. But we we were using AWS and we were losing out on a lot of uh, the cool features that AWS managed services has, right? And uh, we were spending a lot of money for that and that was something that we wanted to change. And expensive because you, like I said before, thousands of dollars per client and you're going to wrap up your bill. Beyond expensive, the problem was our product needed to grow and we wanted to have a, a real-time uh, pipeline through which all the product information comes in, all the user metadata, all the user event information comes in, and we wanted a real-time uh, solution. And with this monolithic architecture, it was not possible. And the key difference between our solution and 
other different visual e-commerce, uh, visual recommendations and solutions work. We are personalizable at uh, user level. So user A, user B looks at the same product. The recommendations that we give for both users is going to be completely different based on the user's past history, his ad to cards, his buy history, all those things. So this level of personalization cannot be achieved uh, at uh, very uh, using this kind of a old style architecture. We wanted to break it down so that there are few pieces that can be cached. There are many pieces that can't be cached. Those things can be improved or uh, it can be made more efficient. So these were all the things that we wanted to do. So if I show you this diagram, this is going to be just another module uh, based architecture or microservices based architecture. Of course, this is the actual structure, how it is being built, but we, when we started building it, we didn't want to do it like this. We wanted to have a code name for it, and it was Project Gotham. And we are going to show a lot of characters that are in Gotham, and that is, uh, a few of the things are internal jokes, but you can get a gist of what each piece is about. So coming to the first piece, ingestion. This is the piece where the client gives us product metadata information. And they give us in various formats like uh, XML, JSON, uh, CSV, and so on. And they also send it through different kinds of protocols, like HTTP. Uh, there were a few who sent it to SQS, and uh, there were a few who put their dump in the FTP server, and they were like uh, fairly old school. So, this, in, this ingestion is the most important piece because this needs to, uh, only if the data that comes in is clean, all the other pieces will work, right? So, and this was the major cause of chaos. So, naturally we had to call it the Joker. And the Joker microservice uh, converts the feed that the customers give and presents it, uh, it converts it into, uh, into internal, uh, internal format. And the format we chose is called as MAD format. So the Joker's job is just simple. Take the feed, convert it to MAD format, and push it to the next service, microservice. So it has to uh, process uh, both batch process and real-time data also. So a lot of other requirements that Joker had to do, and uh, this used to change pretty often because they used to screw up some fields, they used to miss fields, and uh, a lot of uh, problems that happen internal to the e-commerce companies, they propagate to us. So Joker was one, the first piece. Second is Gordon, this is Commissioner Gordon, and he polices the data, routes the data to the correct microservices based on different rules. So if it is a new product that has come in, he has to send it to microservice A, B, and C. If it is an update to the product, he has to send it to B and C. If it is a specific update like a price change or uh, availability or stock information, he will probably send it to just microservice B and so on. So this is a very uh, rules rule based router, and this used to this didn't care about which uh, which client's data it is. It was a multi tenanted uh, service, and it used to flow through Amazon SQS and uh, the output was also through SQS and other HTTP calls. Then there was one moment, this is technically not a microservice, but it was actually a tool which we used to uh, define how the different uh, categories of products that the customer sends. So if you guys have used Photoshop, uh, there is a lasso tool, which you can select the region, right? So one moment has a lasso and it almost does the same thing. So that's the idea behind one moment. So we use a sample data set and we draw, not draw exactly, have rules which draw these kind of uh, lasso and uh, we pass it on uh, to the image processing microservice, which is further down the line. So uh, this watchtower is technically not a ingestion microservice, but it's a data store. And this is the single source of truth that we uh, store all the metadata in. So Gordon will send the first copy of the data to watchtower and it is going to store it in Postgres and it can access, we can access data through HTTP or through, uh, we can take a dump of all the data and all those possible features. So when we take ingestion itself, these are all the different pieces, there are multiple jokers. For each client you will have uh, 
uh, one joker, then there will be Gordon which routes them all to the different microservices, the next stages. It sends one copy to Watchtower and it also sends a sample data to Wonderman. This is how we just send the module itself has been split into. So second thing is the image processing. So the microservice that we call is for image processing is called Nightwing. Nightwing is actually a DC comic. Uh, technically he's Robin who grows up to become Nightwing. So uh, he, uh, sorry, he, uh, Nightwing does uh, all the deep learning, all those kind of cool neural network kind of thing. It, what it basically does for, according to us, is it takes the images, converts it into the high dimensional vector, about 21,000 features, and it uh, sends it off to the next service. That's all Nightwing is. It's a very, uh, the job it does is very simple, but it's a very, very compute intensive uh, task. Uh, microservice and we prefer to use compute intensive instances instead of GPU instances for most of the Nightwing tasks but in case there are a few very heavy uh, millions of products needs to be processed with a few hours those kind of things we do have a GPU version also and then there is the image search of microservice which is Batman and uh, we need to like this is the most heavyweight instance uh, heavyweight microservice that we have it basically does two things. It indexes the features and uh, all the features for the millions of products and it is able to do a very fast visual search on these uh, features. So uh, these are the two things that Batman does and the SLA, every microservice has their own SLAs but Batman is, needs to return back in a few tens of milliseconds. So even if you have tens of millions of products in your catalog, the visual, uh, visually similar products that we Batman returns is going to get back in about 20 or 30 milliseconds max. And to do that, this all the data needs to reside in memory. So this is a very, very memory intensive uh, application that is running. Of course, there is a disk backup. We use Dynamo for storing all the vector information in the, in the backend. So it's a backup kind of thing. So Batman is the image searcher the heavyweight thing. Then, so I was talking about the uh, product uh, side of the things. That is the user side of uh, things. Right? So data from user events, like a user clicks on a particular product, he interacts with the recommendation engine, uh, the widgets in that, or he adds to wish list, add to cart, uh, buys that, all those different events that are about like 36 or 40 events that we track, on the customer's website or the mobile app. And this data flows in through CloudFront and there is a separate uh, data warehousing uh, pipeline, the data pipeline which uh, stores all this information. And the personalization engine takes all this user data and it uh, creates different data models out of it. So there are two pieces in the personalization engine side and uh, that is so mad. So the first one is the user behavior based data. So like I said, the history of uh, in, uh, individual user, all those things. Uh, so this is the widgets that say people who bought this also bought these products or people who viewed these products bought, ended up buying these products. Those kind of widgets that you see in Amazon, right? So this is the microservice which gives you the output that uh, I just talked about. And, uh, it has products like collaborative filtering, cross product, all those kinds of uh, data analysis kind of uh, products. Then uh, this is overall, you segment users into groups and then say, these kind of users do these kind of things. But like I said before, our unique selling proposition is uh, individual user level personalization, right? So uh, we needed a microservice which is able to do very fast personalization and it is it sends a particular set of products or recommendations for individual users. And Two-Face did that. Initially, Two-Face was designed to do a, a, a A-B testing. It was built as an A-B testing framework. Then we decided, okay, personalization is, uh, is uh, closely ties into this and we uh, did a personalization. This, this is called as a dynamic personalization framework and uh, Two-Face is a microservice that's, that does this. So going quickly to the other data source, like I said before, there's Watchtower, which is the actual source of truth. Then 
There is Flash, which is a very fast data structure server, basically a Redis instance, and we store stuff like the user event history, uh, the session related uh, uh, data, and uh, product availability information, those kind of things in Flash. And it's very fast because based on Redis and uh, it works well for us. And uh, the important thing is the data you have in Flash shouldn't expire. It is, uh, it is actually, uh, we don't set any expiry on these kind of things. Then there is GCPD, Government City Police Department, but we call it as Global Cache for the Products Digester. This is the acronym for that. And uh, this is a rough first level of cache that we have. So Batman, Superman, all these microservices, they put their data into GCPD which is to be used by the next layer, which is the API, I will explain about that. And this can expire, but it shouldn't expire uh, based on Redis expiry logic. So we had to build a custom library which has, uh, even though the uh, cache element is expired, we uh, have the content in the uh, GCPD uh, server and then there was a certain logic that was built into that. Coming to the API layer, Robin handles the API. This is very lightweight, and uh, we decoupled. Uh, if you remember the old API and the image server, uh, image searcher uh, architecture, we have decoupled Batman and Robin. We have split them apart, and we uh, Robin does uh, very fast uh, HTTP uh, API responses. So any kind of uh, uh, let's say, for example, for uh, user ABC, uh, he's viewing product one, two, three. Uh, give me these recommendation widgets. So give me visually similar, give me uh, cross product products, all those things. So what Robin does is it does a very fast uh, Batman call, it does a very fast uh, Superman call and collates all these uh, results and then presents uh, meet JSON response. So it does use part of GCPD, but because personalization needs to be taken into account, the result from GCPD is now uh, mixed with the personalization results and uh, it does a very uh, quick calculation and uh, resorts the results and then sends it. And there's the second level of complexity here because our products, like I said, is, uh, the product catalog is sent through a, a real-time stream and availability, stock information and uh, pricing information, all these things change at a very fast pace. Every minute it changes. So. Robin needs to do a very quick watchtower call and then say, okay, for these set of products, these are all the latest available products, so I have to not send the uh, out of stock products and then it does a lot of filtering based on uh, the custom fields that we have. So this is what Robin does. <clears throat> Overall, this is uh, how it all ties together. Of course, I haven't explained about all the other microservices that are there, but these are all the main things that we use and uh, which explain what uh, product does. So there is uh, Joker God and Wonder Woman which was part of Ingestion, then there is uh, uh, Nightwing and Batman which does the image processing and image searching, then there is Superman and Two-Face which does personalization and user event related products which all ties into Robin which is the end, end uh, API that our clients use. So um, this is how it uh, finally after two years of different kinds of iterations this is how it went to. And the lessons that we learned were more interesting. So this one is a given, this is lesson zero. You can't start, you can't start with a microservice architecture in mind and then build it. You have to start with the monolith <coughs> and you have to break away small pieces and identify this service needs to be residing on its own and this service, uh, it makes sense to have be together and so on. So uh, this, this uh, Conway's law, we could have, Heard about this, so uh, organizations which design systems eventually build systems which mimic the communication channel in the organization. So initially, before I joined, there was one backend engineer in Mastery then, and then I joined, then uh, Narain, uh, who is the next speaker, joined. So we three, once we joined, we split into microservices and uh, we started building this. But the corollary is not true, right? So since we have three people, you can't expect three microservices only and each person has to manage multiple microservices and uh, they have to balance them. So this is a very important uh, lesson. 
And uh, second is we had to deploy heterogeneous microservices in the server. So uh, this explains it better. So uh, there is a compute optimized server which is used primarily by Nightwing, but there are few microservices which doesn't require so much CPU. And for example, Joker or God and these microservices are on the ingestion side and they are more I.O. intensive. So you can uh, cluster them together in a single server. Of course, you need to leave a little bit of gap so that it can grow. But you pack them up or bind them together and uh, have a separate uh, instance. And there is other side which is Batman, which is like I said, a more memory heavy service. And uh, they have, uh, uh, it doesn't require too much CPU, and uh, and Robin does a few CPU intensive tasks. So we uh, uh, we have uh, clubbed both Batman and Robin together, and uh, since they are on the uh, API or recommendation serving side of things, it makes sense to move them all to uh, together, right? So uh, this is one uh, thing. Of course, in recent days, you can uh, you can just put them all in Docker and. Uh, we can expect Kubernetes to handle them all together all automatically, but not every like uh, the other speakers have told, not every microservice can be containerized, and uh, we have to. There are a few things which aren't Dockerized yet. Like for example, Nightwing is uh, we do a lot of GPU intensive things too, so we don't Dockerize that. Batman is more uh, is also running on its own uh, VM, so there are a few things that we don't Dockerize. And uh, lesson two. Create immutable microservices. This was a thing that we learned later, but we were doing this without even knowing that this was a rule, right? So this is uh, famous in the Netflix side of engineering. And uh, what they do is they create immutable uh, microservices. Each microservice version will run and fill all the data that's coming to that is stopped. Uh, you, they don't shut this down, even though there are multiple versions coming. So to give an example of how we were doing this without even knowing this rule was Gordon. So Gordon was a commissioner, but he didn't start off as a commissioner, right? So we had different versions of Gordon. First he was a constable, then inspector, assistant commissioner, then the commissioner. So each version we had this kind of uh, commissioner, right? By assistant commissioner, right? So the versions were like, instead of having uh, Semver, we were using this kind of uh, things. So, uh, this is how, so even though the uh, assistant commissioner version of the garden was running, uh, uh, the inspector version was not uh, uh, decommissioned. So they were like running in parallel, there are few clients who were still on the older version. Similarly, Batman, Nightwing, everyone has their own different versions running simultaneously. Uh, lesson three is asynchronous is better than synchronous. Not always, but in majority of the cases, we have started using SQS queues and message passing and all those things uh, instead of doing direct uh, REST calls or uh, HTTP, those kind of things. So basically queues are better. So start following queues and uh, uh, use message passing. Uh, we use, uh, to give an example, we have SQS for all the ingestion related queues. Then all the user, user events and all those things are handled through RabbitMQ, which is much faster and uh, uh, easy. So there are different kinds of queues that we use to handle this. And uh, this is a lesson that we learned. There are a few services that needs to be synchronous. For example, uh, Robin needs to be synchronous. And uh, <coughs> uh, there are, uh, Nightwing also has a part of piece uh, which is synchronous. Because if we do uh, image search, uh, of uh, user generated content, it has to be done in real time. You can't wait for the queue to be uh, consumed and then you do it. Right? So, there are a few pieces that are still synchronous, but try to use asynchronous as much as possible if you can. Then, uh, yeah, this one I said before not all microservices need to be containers or on servers. So, there was one microservice which I said was Wonder Woman, which it's, uh, it's actually a tool that is running on a laptop or a thing. Uh, you know, on a computer and uh, people, whenever a new client or someone comes in, uh, a computation guy will come and he will uh, 
uh, look at the sample data and say, okay, these are these rules make sense. Fine, you can go ahead. And that's the job of uh, one woman. It, it is not deployed on a server or things like that. So that is one lesson. And uh, you have to build tooling to automate your uh, microservices. So with, like I said before, in the first two images, right? Uh, balancing a single drop is uh, problematic, but balancing uh, tens of uh, smaller rocks is even more uh, painful, right? So we had to build tools later to automate most of the menial tasks that we used to do in the and uh, that helped a lot. So this one is very important because, uh, of course, I haven't mentioned a lot of microservices. There was, there's one microservice which handles <coughs> all the logging related stuff. And uh, Narayan, my colleague, is going to explain about the logging microservice in detail. But when you're logging, make sure you attach a transaction ID or a request ID to all the log messages. This is very important because uh, any kind of microservice does even uh, pro does some kind of processing based on the input that is received, right? So it could be an image that comes in, or the metadata that comes in. The, it passes through multiple microservices and when that ingestion happens, attach a transaction ID to that and propagate the transaction ID to every microservice. That helps a lot in debugging the uh, when you have a problem. So initially we did do this and uh, later on we realized okay this, is, this needs to be done. Similarly the other side of uh, any HTTP APIs that get passed it needs to be uh, it needs to have a request ID around that and uh, people will forget this when they initially start writing microservices. So make sure you have uh, re uh, request ID or transaction ID. Last is more important for me at least. So give a character to your microservice because uh, the gives you sort of like the team uh, comes together with the characters, right? So there are people who work specifically on specific microservices. If you just say image processing microservice, image uh, searcher microservice, and so on, it's not too uh, too fun to work with, right? So we have spent countless nights or days, nights working on these kind of microservices and since we had this kind of, we were spending a lot of brainstorming sessions on what we should name each microservice and a lot of fun was uh, uh, was had during the building stages of uh, this architecture, this logging architecture. So there are many other characters that needs to be put in, there are other, <coughs> we have started with DC, we have still Marvel and a lot of other uh, comics to add to. So uh, this helps us in, uh, also this is more funny because when there is an on-call uh, thing and people say I don't get any results, you can say okay Batman is down or something like that. So it's more funny and uh, uh, these kind of things are uh, cool. So if there is one takeaway that you can take from this talk, I would probably I'd say this is the one. So uh, that's, that's it I have. Uh, so if the slides are available in this link, uh, my personal blog if you want to take down uh, this from that and uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at CV. So any questions you got? Questions anyone? Everybody's talking about uh, serverless architectures like lambdas yeah. and stuff like that. So, have we explored some of those? Yeah, we have explored some of those. So, uh, multiple places we have uh, explored the serverless architecture. For example, there is the logging thing that I said, right? It was initially built on servers, then we have they started exploring the uh, serverless architecture. They have started using uh, basic lambda, they have been using lambda for a few of the things, and there is the uh, Aetna. There is uh, S3, all those things. So there are a lot of uh, serverless things that he's going to explain about uh, in during the logging thing. Apart from that, there are multiple products that we have built on top of this platform, right? So there is one particular microservice which uh, not microservice. There is one particular product which we have been building, which is a video processing uh, product. So it uh, there are videos of e-commerce companies, right? They have models, all those things. So we. We detect the key frames where the products are visible 
and then we do a match against the the our uh, product catalog of the client, and then we give recommendation. So all the video processing, all those things are done using servers. So we use AWS. Uh, uh, we use Lambda to kick off the transporting service, and uh, then the output is all passed to the next stages and so on. So there are smaller pieces that we have moved to serverless, and uh, logging is something that we have been uh, started to slowly migrate towards uh, serverless. But that is, uh, yes, yeah, that is happening. Any more questions? No? All right. Thanks, Rini. Thank you. So if there's anything, please catch us at the booth.